I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. Jesus' first sermon was powerful. Not only did it mark the beginning of his public ministry, but Jesus' first sermon also turned the world upside down. It is recorded for us in Matthew 5 and is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, it is just a way of saying Jesus preached on the side of a mountain. Jesus preached about many things during that sermon, but in Matthew 7 verses 15 to 20, he tells us to be aware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus knew that they were already around, and he knew that these false prophets would be a real threat to the truth of the gospel. Paul also warned the Ephesian elders against false prophets in Acts chapter 20 verses 29 to 31. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come amongst you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. In Paul's final letter to Timothy, written shortly before he was executed by Nero, he said, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but, having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The Apostle Peter in both of his letters, and the Apostle John in all three of his letters, warns believers about false teachers. I will not go into any more details about that, as I have already covered that aspect during the previous podcasts about the letters of Peter and John. So, Jesus warned us that false prophets and teachers would come. Paul warned us that false prophets would arise. Peter warned us about them as well, as did John. So where does this little letter of Jude fit in? Tucked in between John's three letters and the Revelation. Revelation is at the end of the Bible, the very last book. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. There is nothing to add after Revelation. Revelation ends with the return of Jesus Christ and his millennial kingdom, the end of Satan and the end of sin, the coming of the new heaven and the new earth and then on into eternity. This letter of Jude warns us that everything about false prophets and apostasy that Jesus, Paul, Peter and John warned us would be coming has already come, and is already present in the church, and he is calling the faithful believers to fight for the faith until Jesus comes again. One thing that many Christians fail to realize is that the true church will never stop fighting this battle until all the events of Revelation have been fulfilled. So, the letter of Jude is a severe word from a man who refers to himself in the first verse only as Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. We can easily identify him. His brother James was very well known as a leader in the early church in Jerusalem and was also the author of the letter of James, which we have in our New Testament. We have already covered the letter of James in episodes 5 and 6 of Journey Through the Scriptures. Jude was famous, not only because he was in himself an important man in the early church, but he was also the natural half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Along with James, he had grown up in the little town of Nazareth with Jesus himself. Notice, however, that Jude does not mention his relationship to Jesus anywhere in his letter, but refers to himself only as a servant of Jesus Christ. After the resurrection, Jude, like James, had become convinced that Jesus, his half-brother in nature, was indeed God manifest in the flesh. 
just like John 1 verses 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Jude saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jude now worships him. Both Jude and James had a unique experience in the Christian church. They became the disciples of the one with whom they grew up. What a clear testimony this gives of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone is in a position to refute the claim of Jesus of being God, it would be the brothers of Jesus. Although they did not come to believe him or follow him until after his resurrection, these letters provide a confirmation that the claims of the New Testament concerning Jesus Christ are valid. Notice as well that Jude is quite content to say he is the brother of James. There is no sibling rivalry here. He knows that God always has a place for everyone and he is perfectly willing to take that place. Jude is often overlooked during Bible study and in my opinion is one of the most underrated letters of the New Testament. Firstly, Jude is a short little letter one of the shortest in the New Testament. However, little books of the Bible are just as valuable to God as the big books, and they should be to all of us. I am the first to admit that when I was preparing for this podcast and did the initial reading of the letter of Jude, I thought I could have easily finished the letter in a single episode. However, the more I discovered about this little gem at the end of the New Testament, the more I realized the wealth and value that Jude had to offer. Secondly, the letter of Jude is a strange letter. It refers to things about which we know little or nothing. It refers to a strange story about Michael the archangel arguing with Satan as to who owned the body of Moses. Thirdly, where did Jude get all these strange stories from? Where is he quoting from? Is he quoting from the Old Testament? There is nothing in the Old Testament about an argument over the body of Moses. Fourthly, Jude is a very severe book. It is stern, serious, and somber. We always like to be cheered up. We want to read our Bible and feel better after we have read it. But Jude's letter does very little of that. Finally, Jude is a very sharp book. It has a sharp cutting edge which exposes raw flesh. That is the real problem within the global church. The flesh. This little letter will cut through flesh and expose it, so it is going to sting. We are sensitive and the only real reason we neglect a passage of scripture is that we do not like it. Consider what James says in his own letter, in chapter 1, verses 23 to 24. For if anyone is a bearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. How many of us look in the mirror at ourselves and do not like what we see? Jude never says to which church he is writing. But it must be a specific church because it is a specific problem that he has heard about. He is careful not to give the name or the location of the church, so he puts his thoughts in general terms. This allows us to receive this letter as if it were written to us directly. Why can I say that? Jude says in the second part of verse 1, To all those who are called beloved in the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. If you can apply these three words, called, beloved, and kept to yourself, then this letter is for you. The first surprise that Jude's letter holds for us is here in verse 3. It seems that this was not the letter that he had originally intended to write to the church. I am reading from the Amplified Bible here. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I was compelled to write to you urgently, appealing that you fight strenuously for the defense of the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith that is the sum of Christian belief that was given verbally to believers. Jude had started out to write a letter containing all the things that pertain to the salvation of us all. He was certainly qualified to do this and had perhaps been pressured by others in the church to write an account of what he had experienced as a brother of the Lord Jesus. But news had come to him of an outbreak of some false and very dangerous teaching within the church. 
he feels prompted by the Holy Spirit to stop the essay that he was going to write and to write the short and to the point letter instead. The letter is so short that it would have easily fitted onto a single papyrus page. Evidently, Jude's original essay never got written, as it doesn't appear in the New Testament. But there is no denying that Jude's little letter is a very valuable addition to Scripture. So he writes to them to fight strenuously for the defense of the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. There are some compelling things about that particular instruction. Firstly, it states that our faith is not something that anyone has manufactured. It was handed or delivered to us. It was not fabricated or concocted by a group of people. It is a single body of facts that is consistently delivered by the apostles, and it has come to us through them. Secondly, Jude says it was once for all handed down. It was only given at one time in the history of the world, and it does not need any additions or amendments. The letter of Jude lying right at the end of the New Testament is an extremely helpful letter to use when answering all the claims of the cults and false doctrines today. The source of every false doctrine that has ever appeared is answered right here in the letter of Jude. Just look at the Mormon religion for instance. They maintain that the revelation that God gave us did not stop with the New Testament, but we need new books and new revelations. But Jude answers this when he says, that you fight strenuously for the defense of the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. It was given to us through the apostles at one particular time in history, and it does not need any additions. Thirdly, Jude tells us that it needs to be proclaimed or contended for. The Greek word that is translated as fight strenuously in the Amplified Version is epagonisthe, which means to struggle with skill and commitment in opposing whatever is not of faith. Fighting strenuously for the faith or contending does not mean beating people over the head with the Bible. Jude is not telling us to be contentious or combative. He is simply talking about the need for proclaiming the truth. I think Charles Spurgeon explains Jude's intention best in one of his most well-known quotes from an 1886 sermon. The truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose, and the lion will defend itself. This is how God's word should be handled. If we begin to proclaim it, it will defend itself. The reason why Jude was forced to write this letter was that false teachers had infiltrated the church. He says so in verse 4, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. What bothered Jude and should bother us all is that this was not an attack from outside the church. The attack did not come from pagans. The enemies were people who professed to be Christians. They had arisen within the church and were doing two things. Firstly, they were perverting the grace of God and using it as a license to live an immoral, sexually depraved life. They were teaching basically that it did not make any difference what you did with your body as long as your spirit was right. You could indulge the body to the full since it was no good anyway. It was the spirit that counted. Secondly, they were saying that the grace of God is so generous that He could forgive anything you did. Therefore, the more you sinned, the more grace you receive. This same perverse teaching can be seen in our own day. It is being preached from pulpits of so-called Christians from within the church. Old-fashioned biblical condemnation of licentiousness and immorality have been cast aside, and we now have a new morality. This new morality is centered on the Christian principle of love. If you love someone, it is taught that it does not make any difference what you do with them, Love justifies anything. This is an exact duplicate of the first century heresy that brought such condemnation from the pen of the Apostle Jude. How does Jude handle this problem? Firstly, he points out that God will not ignore this kind of perverse heresy. The judgment of this kind of person is certain. Jude supplies three biblical examples to support it. Firstly, Jude reminds the readers that when God brought the people out of Egypt, well over 2.4 million people were saved by the power and the right hand of God. 
But as Exodus chapter 12 verses 38 tells us, a mixed multitude also went with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. Jude 1 verse 5 says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. While some of them were really believers, others were not. They were all delivered, and they were all set free from Egyptian slavery. They all went through the Red Sea and all experienced God's miraculous care and provision. But when they came into the wilderness, God began to choose and judge amongst them. Those who murmured and complained and rejected his leadership, refusing to enter into the land he judged, all the rest perished in the wilderness. Out of the 2.4 million people that left Egypt, only two men entered into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. The children of the Israelites did enter the promised land, but this was God revealing that he has a way of dealing with those who refuse to act by faith and live in trust. Jude verse 6 talks about the second example. And the angels who did not stay within their position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. These angels lived in the very presence of God and ministered before him. Yet they followed Satan in his rebellion. They came to earth and had sexual relations with women. Thus they too were reserved for judgment. Jude's point is that even angels are not excluded from judgment when they fall into pride and lust. And pride and lust characterize these false teachers that Jude was referring to. In the third example, Jude reminds them of the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. These two cities at the southern end of the Dead Sea had a society that was so far decayed that the practice of homosexuality was so blatant and widely accepted that when angels visited Lot, the men of the city surrounded his house and ordered Lot to bring those men out so that they might have sex with them. For this, God judged and destroyed that city. Jude reminds us all that God does not take these things lightly. Judgment is waiting for all mankind. It might be sudden, like Sodom and Gomorrah, or it might be delayed as in the case of the angels, or it might come about in natural processes like those who came out of Egypt and died in the wilderness. God is not going to ignore it. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2 verses 2 to 3 that we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself? that you will escape the judgment of God? This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 16.